Dear intercessors and prayer warriors, this is part three in my series on the mark of the beast. In the first part, uh, I laid the foundation to show you from the scriptures that this is something that the church, the believers will go through, will face in the end times before the rapture and the second coming of Messiah. Uh, in part two, I uh, gave a uh, brief summary of the blessed hope, the hope that is set before us that is able to carry us through this very difficult time that will be a time of testing coming upon the whole world. Now we're going to go into the mark of the beast itself and um, I'm going to read from the book of Revelation. First I just want to mention briefly though from chapter 3 and verse 10 because this is a verse that is many times used to try to prove that we will not have to face the great tribulation. It says here in uh, this translation, the ESV, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So this is what some people like to um, use as a text to show that we are not going to have to face this hour of trial, including the mark of the beast. But this has to be uh, compared to two other scriptures uh, to show us how, Paul, uh, how the Bible, I should say, is using this phrase to be kept from uh, trials. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 11, Paul writes here, My persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. So Paul had to endure these persecutions. And yet he writes that uh, God uh, kept him and he rescued him from them all. In other words, out of them all. He came out uh, saved by God. He did not uh, have to uh, succumb to these uh, horrible uh, sufferings that he had to endure. And the same thing is also described very clearly in Psalm 34 and verse 20, or actually verse 19 in the English Bibles, where it says, many are the reflect the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So this is a prophecy about the Messiah, of course, but it's also about all people who are righteous, that they have to suffer many afflictions. They will not escape afflictions, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. So this is very important to have, uh, have as a foundation, these scriptures, uh, that we will face these, this time of testing and trial. In fact, Paul and Barnabas also told the new disciples that they had been, uh, that they won on their first missionary journey. They encouraged them, telling them, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. The time of testing will come. And part of that is what we're studying here now about the mark of the beast. Go, uh, going now to Revelation chapter 13, we are going to read the text. And I want to begin in verse 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire coming down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth 
telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes, and now it comes, <clears throat> also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For its number, it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So this is something that many people, not only those who are believers, in fact, are very familiar with. The mark of the beast system, 666. Now... We're going to go through, I'm going to go through these verses and to show you uh, what is happening in front of our eyes right now. But I want to begin uh, in the end here where it says in verse 18 that this calls for wisdom. We need wisdom. It is calling for wisdom. Uh, we are going to need wisdom in order to discern uh, what is going on with this mark of the beast. And how can we get that wisdom? There is primary, uh, primarily only one way, and it is through the Word of God. It's not the wisdom of going to university, of studying science. It's not even the wisdom of theological training, but it is the wisdom of the scriptures. Uh, I want to go back actually to 2 Timothy chapter 3 where we just read verse 11 and then I will pick up here from verse 13. Evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse deceiving and being deceived. Here once again we're warned about the great deceptions that are going to be so prevalent in the last days. And uh, <clears throat> then it says here in verse 14, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. So this is Paul writing to Timothy, and he is reminding him how he has learned the gospel and the truth from Paul and also from other apostles. This is so important that we stick to what the original teaching of the apostles uh, is, as we can see in the, primarily in the New Testament. So we need to stick to what was the original um, version of the gospel, so to speak, that we have in the Word of God, so that we will not leave it or forsake it. Jude says in uh, uh, his epistle in verse 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That is the faith that came through the apostles, and it was given once for all. It is not to be changed. We cannot go by just uh, theolo uh, theology that has developed over the centuries in the church. We must come back to the original gospel that we find in the Bible from the apostles. Okay, now we come to verse 15 in 2 Timothy 3 here. And how from childhood... You have been acquainted with the sacred writings or with the holy scriptures, as it can also be translated, which are able, listen to this, the holy scriptures. And this is referring 
not to just the New Testament. This is something that Timothy had known from childhood, way before he heard the gospel and he came to faith in Yeshua. He had been uh, had his upbringing in the synagogue because his mother was Jewish. So he had learned what we call today the Old Testament from childhood. And this is what Paul is reminding Timothy what it will do to him. You know from childhood and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Messiah Yeshua. The Bible, the Holy Scriptures, both the teaching of the apostles that we call the New Testament and the writings of the prophets, the Old Testament, they are inspired by God, able to give us wisdom and understanding so that we can be saved through the faith we have in Messiah Yeshua. It's not just enough to believe uh, in Yeshua. We have to also uh, follow very uh, diligently the teachings or the teaching of the Bible. Uh, Peter is reminding us of the same thing in his second uh, epistle. I'm going to read from chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3 from verse 1. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Now it comes here in verse 2, that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets. That is what has been written uh, in the holy scriptures that we call the Old Testament. They are uh, prophetic, pointing forward to the coming of Messiah and salvation through him. So this is what you should be reminded of. It says that you, by way of reminder, that you shall remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. That is the New Testament. That is the apostolic teaching that has been given to us from uh, the Master, Yeshua, the Messiah. So we need both the Old and the New Testaments, the wisdom from the Scriptures, so that we can uh, discern what is going to take place in the end times. Uh, Peter is also writing in the first chapter of Second Peter about the same thing. Uh, we're going to read from verse 19 here. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention. And some translations even use the expression to uh, pay close attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I cannot emphasize this enough, that when it comes to uh, the deceptions of the Antichrist and this uh, subject of the mark of the beast, the Bible tells us that this is something that calls for wisdom. And the only way that we can receive that wisdom is by studying the Holy Scriptures. I want to uh, also go to Matthew chapter 24 that we have uh, studied a lot here in this series and read from verse 15 because the mark of the beast is connected with the uh, image of the beast, of the Antichrist. And that is something that is described also in Matthew tw uh, chapter 24 by Yeshua, Jesus himself. In verse 15 it says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, and now it comes, let the reader understand. This is also calling for understanding that we might, must pay close attention 
to the prophetic word that can make us wise. It calls for wisdom to discern these things that are going to come upon the earth. I'm reminded also of Luke 21, uh, where Yeshua is, is speaking about the end times, and he is calling us to really be watchful about the things that are going to take place. It says here in verse 36, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. How can we escape it? By being wise through the prophetic word. We must pay close attention to it, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Uh, that is the only way we can gain the wisdom and the understanding to discern what is happening in the end times, so that we might escape these traps, these temptations that are going to come. Uh, <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Let's be going back here to 2 Peter chapter 1 and read on in verse 20. We just read verse 19 about paying attention to the prophetic word. Uh, verse 20, knowing this first of all, uh, in this subject now, on this subject about paying close attention to the prophetic word, Peter, he instructs us here with something that is very important. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. This is explained now in the next verse. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the prophetic word has not its origin in man's will or in man's interpretation and understanding. It is a word that is inspired by the Holy Spirit as these prophets were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's so important to understand that the prophetic word does not originate in man's wisdom or in man's will. It, it is something that has been inspired by the Holy Spirit. And because it has been inspired by the Holy Spirit and does not originate with man, it must also be revealed by the Holy Spirit because it cannot be uh, understood just from our intellect or by, through our will. It is necessary for the same Holy Spirit that inspired the prophetic word to reveal that word to us. I want to read some uh, passages on that from, uh, for, uh, from first from John's Gospel chapter 16 and verse thir uh, 13, I want to read verse 12 also for the sake of context. This is when Yeshua is giving his farewell speech to his uh, apostles uh, in the upper room in this last uh, occasion he had with them before his suffering. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Verse 13. When the Holy Spirit of truth comes, or when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. That's so precious. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth and he teach us about things that are to come. Verse 14, he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. He is the one who has to declare the word to us, explain and reveal the word to us. Uh, let's also look at chapter 14 and verse 
25 and 26. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. That is the teacher that we must hearken to. Uh, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. It is so important that we engross ourselves in the Holy Scriptures, fill our minds and our hearts with the Scriptures so that the Holy Spirit can remind us of these Scriptures and instruct us and uh, lead us into all truth and explain to us what is going to come. Final scripture on the same uh, topic, 1 John chapter 2. Once again, extremely important things here is in the context of the Antichrist. Um, John is writing um, verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Verse 27. But the anointing that you received from him. That's another expression for the Holy Spirit. It's the, uh, that is likened to oil. And here it's called, the Holy Spirit is called the anointing. But the anointing you received from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and it is true, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. I need to explain this. This shows us that we are not to follow man. We are to, it's not man that is to instruct us. Yet, the Holy Spirit has also set teachers in the body of Messiah. So we need those gifts of people who have been anointing to teach the scriptures. But what they share is something that we must discern as something from God by the witness inside of us, the Holy Spirit, the anointing that bears witness with the truth. We are not to follow man, but we are to follow what the Holy Spirit delivers to us through people who teach us the, the word of God. And also directly by reading the scriptures, but because that is what will help us to discern. Uh, no teacher is perfect. Uh, and that's why we need to discern when we hear teaching from the Bible, what is from God and what is not from God. Everything must be tested by the scriptures through the help of the Holy Spirit enlightening the scriptures to us. The prophetic word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It has not originated from man's intellect or will. And that's why it must also be revealed by the Holy Spirit. Through us carefully paying attention to the prophetic word and spending time in prayer and fellowship with God so that we can discern the anointing uh, what, is, what is from God and what is not from God. Uh, we must not be careless about these things, friends. This is our lifeline in the end times. When we stand before the judgment seat of Messiah, uh, we cannot say, uh, excuse ourselves and say, well, so, uh, so and so was teaching these things and that's why I believe them. Well, then the Lord is going to say, what did I tell you in your word? That's what you need to follow. I have given you the word. I have given you the anointing, the Holy Spirit to teach you and lead you into all truth. And it's the responsibility of every believer to be, uh, make sure that he is being taught by God. That's the new covenant. Uh, quickly, let's look also at Hebrews chapter 8, um, where it says, uh, 
I'm just jumping down to verse 11 for the sake of time. This is describing the new covenant. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Everyone can know what is from God and what is not from God. And it does not have to do with human intellect and uh, IQ. It has to do with our relationship to the Lord through the scriptures and, and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So um, we're going to now <clears throat> uh, go on here studying chapter 13 in the book of Revelation. And um, we, we began to read in verse 11 where it says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. This should be compared to what it says in the first verse that is describing uh, what is called the Antichrist. It says, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on his horns and blasphemous names on its head. This is what we understand uh, this first beast uh, to be what is also described as the lawless one or the Antichrist. And this beast is rising up out of the sea. The sea in scripture is a picture of the nations. Let me just give you one example by, uh, of several that we could point to. Isaiah 60 verse 5 in the second half of the verse it says about Jerusalem. The abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. So here is this, um, it, it, the abundance of the sea and the wealth of the nations are describing the exact same thing. The sea is a picture of the nations uh, in, as opposed to the uh, holy people of God, the, uh, which is Israel. We, we can also look at um, Revelation 17 about the harlot and the beast. And it says in verse 15, And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. This is talking about the nations of the world. That's where the Antichrist will have its origin, among the nations. It is rising up out of the sea. But notice when it comes to the second beast, and incidentally, this second beast is described later on in chapter 19 as the false prophet. This second beast, verse 11, it is rising out of the earth. Uh, so it's it contrasting the earth and the sea. And if the sea is the nations, then the earth. Uh, the Greek word that is used there is the word ge. And that word can also be translated as land. So this is referring to the land of Israel as opposed to the nations of the world. This second beast, the false prophet, is going to come up from the land of Israel. Let me give you uh, just one example of how this Greek word ge is used as also land. Uh, meaning land. In Matthew chapter 2, uh, the angel it says <clears throat> in verse 19, But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land, Ge, the land of Israel. So uh, technically we could translate it as go to the earth of Israel. Well, that doesn't make much sense. Uh, the, uh, Israel is not called earth, it's called land. But it's the same Greek word. So the second beast, in other words, it is something that is going to arise in the land of Israel. Um, and it says that it has two horns. Verse 11 here in chapter 13 of Revelation, it had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. And it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. 
In other words, this second beast called the false prophet is going to be like the deputy of the Antichrist here in the land of Israel. Well, uh, before I go on here, I want to refer now to a, a very old prophecy that was uh, originally given at the end of the 1800s to a godly woman in northern Sweden in an area called Lapland. And uh, that's where the indigenous peoples of Scandinavia uh, live, the, uh, the Sami people. And this, um, this prophecy uh, was, became very well known uh, right after the Second World War because it had predicted, let me say this, first it was given orally from uh, person to person, but then later on it was written down and is today stored in the museum in the capital of that region, which is called Umeå. Uh, it, but it became famous right after the Second World War because it had spoken about a place uh, and a mountain in, uh, in the north where Christ, Messiah, would one day appear in that mountain. Well, lo and behold, in the morning of the 29th of November, 1946, uh, miners were going down into, um, to do their job in the mine in a small village, very close to where the woman had lived, called Christineberg, which in English is almost verbally translated Christ in the mountain. And when they dynamited, as usually in the morning, uh, and the smoke cleared, they saw very clearly a statue of Messiah in the mountain. And this became very um, uh, well known, the information. People started to, to make pilgrimage to this place uh, for a long time and went down into the shaft and looked at this wonder. It was also photographed. I was born very close to this place and my father was a pastor and he kept a picture of that statue of Messiah in the mountain in his office. So I grew up uh, and I still have that picture today uh, that I inherited from him. And uh, it became world, uh, um, it made uh, international uh, fame, I should say, through the largest magazine in the world at that time, Life magazine, that made a, a story about this. And people came from other nations going down into the mountain looking at this wonder. Uh, eventually, because it was exposed to the light, the uh, image began to fade in color and uh, it was harder to see so clearly that image. And uh, eventually they could not receive all the people coming to see it. So they closed the shaft and it is still hidden there today. But I'm just mentioning that because this prophecy, it speaks about the end times and something that very interesting is mentioned there. Um, uh, I'm going to read from the beginning of the prophecy here and you can go to to uh, on the internet and Google this to find out all the information about this prophecy. It's called Christine Berg's Prophetia, Christ in the Mountain Prophecy. In the last days of the world, many false prophets will arise, many of whom will foretell the time of the last judgment. If you hear such words, do not believe what they say, for only God knows about that day. Yes, scripture is very clear. We cannot know the day or the hour. However, like I pointed out before in this series, we shall know when he, the Messiah is at the door. If we pay close attention to the prophetic word and watch in prayer uh, the developments in the world, we should be able to discern when the time has come for the Messiah to return. That means that we should very likely know even the year maybe even the month or the week, but we cannot know the exact day or the exact hour. 
That's what the scriptures say. But then the prophecy continues. The proof that we are nearing the end is the learning of men, which is spreading throughout all the earth. The learning of men, science, that is going to explode in the end times. That is the primary sign or proof that we are nearing the end according to this prophecy. Um, then it says the people will also become selfish and trust only in themselves. Christianity declines and godliness disappears. It continues, people will believe that no God created the earth. Some will believe that the people themselves performed the miracle. So this is the evolution theory that came in the end of the 1800s um, and uh, changed Western thinking uh, is not too much to, to uh, it's not an exaggeration, I should say, that the evolution theory, it has been influencing our societies in a profound way ever since it was released at the end of the 1800s. And then it says, the people of the future will make great inventions even so great that they believe that not even God has performed such miracles. Human ingenuity, this is very interesting, human ingenuity will reshape or recreate the people that God has created, but those people will lack a soul. In other words, science will develop to the point where uh, artificial men are going to appear in the earth. And this is something, according to this prophecy, that is the proof we're nearing the end. And that is something that is happening right now before our very eyes. It's called transhumanism. The, the uh, blending or mixture of humanity with computer technology. Let me go on here. Humans will travel in the sky on dragon-like objects. There will be dragon-like sizzling objects in the sky. I mean, this woman who first gave this prophecy had never heard about airplanes. Um, but that's obviously, and also rockets, what this is referring to. Uh, Sissing-like objects in the sky, on earth, cars, and underground, subways, and so on. At that time, people will rejoice and claim to be masters of the universe, but still they are not happy. The next stage will be the attempt to overcome death. And this is also what is happening now through transhumanism. They are claiming that these people, that they are uh, a mixture of humans and artificial intelligence and computer technology, will overcome death. Uh, no one should have to die without eternal life. All these people will see, but they will no longer have the eyes of wisdom to see with. Yes, they will have knowledge, but they will lack vis wisdom. Those who claim that there is no God are fools, the Bible says. They do not want to repent from their sins, so the plagues of tribulation will pass over all the lands and peoples and of the earth. And in all tongues, lamentation will be heard. End of quote. So this development when man is trying to overcome death and recreate humans, artificial, uh, creating artificial humans, this is what is going to trigger the tribulation of the end times. And uh, I've always had this in the back of my mind, this prophecy uh, as I grew up. And now I see this is coming to pass. Um, let me uh, go to 2 Thessalonians again in chapter 2 and read about the Antichrist where it says in verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way for that day when uh, Yeshua comes and we are going to be gathered to him, that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first or the apostasy comes first 
and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of destruction. And now it says here in verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that his, he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. This is the essence of the Antichrist and the false prophet, that they are going to exalt themselves over everything that is called God and proclaim themselves to be God. Now, this system of uh, the mark of the beast that is going to come with the number 666 uh, so that no one can buy or sell if they don't have this mark either on their head, hand or on their forehead. This is a system that is now science, uh, through science uh, being ready to be implemented. Uh, through the World Economic Forum, whose uh, founder and leader is a man called Klaus Schwab, he stated on French television in uh, January of 2016, he said that in 10 years, meaning in 2026, four years from now, he said every human being on the earth will have a mark on their skin or, or a device, uh, I think it was what he said, implemented on the skin or in the brain, through which all of humanity will be connected to uh, a, computer, a, a computerized system. This is something ready that should be ready implemented in 2026. And friends, it is developing very quickly now. But the interesting thing, so this is clearly a, a complete control, a dictatorship that is about to develop, develop over the whole world, uh, over all of humanity. But, but it's coming through the World Economic Forum. And interestingly, as I record this, uh, from what I understand, the World Economic Forum that meets either every year or biannually, uh, I believe, uh, it is meeting right now in Davos in Switzerland, where all the rich, super rich people of the earth, those who have uh, power and uh, are, are famous, uh, are gathered right now to strategize how to take control over the whole world. That's basically what they are talking about. We must have a new global system to, in order to save the planet. Now, what is interesting, this is certainly uh, an agenda that is uh, like the Tower of Babel, where they were wanted to buy, uh, build a tower that would reach up into the heavens in order to be independent completely uh, of God, to be in rebellion of God. And that is what is happening right now as well in the earth. What is interesting is that the closest advisor to uh, the leader of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, is a young man from the land of Israel. And he, his name is Yuval Noah Harari. He is the one who is like the, the uh, uh, ideologue of the, the World Economic Forum and its leader, Klaus Schwab. Just like we read in the book of Revelation that there will also be a second beast in the land of Israel. And this man, he is a young man, he is only 46 years old. He is considered to be a genius and, and he is professor of his, in history or is a professor at the uh, history department at the Hebrew University here in Jerusalem. And he has become world famous through his books. The first one uh, the book was uh, originally published in 2011. 
here in Israel and it is called in English sapiens which is the scientific name of the human race and it talks about how man has developed into its present uh, form of course so it's all based on evolution uh, fantasy uh, it's not real science it's, it's just fantasy but uh, and the second book, and this book, Sapiens, it was translated into English, published, became a New York bestseller for, uh, for months and months and months uh, in 2014. And Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, he was the one who made uh, Harari world famous by um, uh, promoting that book, Sapiens. Then the second book that Harari wrote, uh, it, it's called, uh, 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 let me see now, I want to get the exact title. It's called uh, Homos Deus. Homos is man, Deus is God. And it, a brief history of tomorrow. And it explains how man is going to become God. There you have it. It's the essence of the Antichrist, exactly. Now, let's, let's read about this. Uh, by the way, I want to say this also. A genius, uh, so-called uh, Yoval Noah Harari, he's openly homosexual. He is uh, married, so to speak, <laughs> uh, uh, with another man. And uh, he's also practicing a form of Hinduism through meditation called Vipassana uh, meditation. He meditates two hours every day. He has also stopped using uh, any smartphone because he wants to be so concentrated in this meditation. Every year he takes at least 30 days to be alone in salt, salt, uh, solitude, uh, in complete uh, silence. Uh, and that's where he gets his, his inspiration. He said he could never have written this book, Homos Deus, How Man Will Become God. Uh, without the inspiration and the strength from his meditation. He considers his meditation to e even be a form of research. So this shows us that his, his mind, his ideas are um, inspired by demons. And that's the message that he's given forth. Now, Revelation 13, 11 says that this false or second beast, had two horns like a lamb. Lamb is uh, speaking of innocence. And a horn is something that expresses uh, uh, authority, uh, strength, and rulership. What are his two horns? What are his two horns? Well, being a history professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, that certainly is very innocent. He is also a world-known uh, author that is also very innocent just like a lamb, but when he speaks, it says here, uh, he sp it spoke like a dragon. And I'm going to quote, uh, make a few quotes from Yobal Noah Harari, that uh, the dragon, of course, uh, is a picture of Satan. And he speaks with such blasphemy, blasphemy um, that is just amazing. And that's uh, he then is the number one uh, ideologue of the World Economic Forum and the, the advisor to the leader of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, who wants to introduce a chip, a mark on the skin or in the brain, uh, read forehead, just like it says in Revelation, of every human being by 20. 26. Here are some of the quotes from Yuval Noah Harari. Um, there are many more, and, uh, but I will just give you these now. I think that fake news has been with us for thousands of years. Just think of the Bible. So here he openly blasphemes the word of God, calling it fake news. He continues, all these stories about Jesus rising from the dead and being the Son of God. This is fake news. Talking about being anti 
Christ, being uh, exalting himself uh, above every god or object of worship. He continues, uh, here's another quote, we have still this myth of free will, and this myth has say, served us well for a couple of centuries, but now it's becoming dangerous. So he calls free will that God has created every human being with a free will. Otherwise, he cannot be called into judgment because uh, if we did not have free will, we have no responsibility. But he, he Harari calls this uh, a myth. And then he says this myth is now becoming dangerous. And he continues, free will, that's now over. That's over. And then he says, we have now reached a point where we can not only hack into computers to get information. We can now hack humans, people. Humans, people are now hackable animals. That's what he called people created in the image of God, that they are hackable animals. Uh, and in continuous control of data might enable, that is computer uh, data, in other words, might enable human elites, those high up, to do something even more radical than just build digital dictatorships. By hacking organisms, including humans, Elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Now we're talking about people exalting themselves to be like God. Science is replacing, I quote here, science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design but not the intelligent design of some God above the clouds. No, our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud. <laughs> I mean, and then he continues, we are really acquiring divine powers of creation and destruction. Let me read that again. We are really acquiring divine powers of creation and destruction. And now it comes. We are really upgrading man or humans into gods. Earth will be populated with entities that are not organic. They don't breathe. They, in other words, they can't even die. They don't have emotions. The big political and economic question of the 21st century will be, what will we, do we need humans for? This is so awful. Or at least, what do we need so many humans for? Uh, and he says, at present, the best guess we have is keep them happy with drugs and computer games. This is a man who is now advising the elites of the world. And interestingly, people like Barack Obama, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, and New York Times and so forth, they call this man, they have given him the nickname, the prophet. I'm telling you, we are seeing something being fulfilled right now before our very eyes, a control, a controlling system that is developing for every individual on the planet. And we see how it is inspired by somebody called the prophet here from the land of Israel. So friends, um, I cannot um, have time now to go deeper into this. I must follow this up with a fourth part in this series where we're going to study this even more in detail. But we are seeing now something 
that is developing exactly like it has been prophesied in the Bible for thousands of years. And this, it's interesting, it is this second beast called the prophet, uh, false prophet that is going to introduce the mark of the beast and that is going to set up an image of the Antichrist and command everyone to worship that image. And if they don't worship that image, they are going to be killed. This is like we've mentioned before, it's exactly what is talked about uh, by Yeshua Jesus in Matthew 24 uh, in uh, verse 15. And I'm not the only one saying this. There many Bible scholars see the parallel here with the image of the beast in Revelation 13 and what is mentioned here in Matthew 24, 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation, an abomination is also an image many times uh, in, in the Bible. And it's an image of desolation, an image that can cause people to die. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. What place is that? The Temple Mount, just like Daniel prophesied. And that's what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2 that we just read that the Antichrist will take his seat in the temple of God. And the Temple Mount is called the Temple of, Mount, uh, of God, whether there is a temple there or not. That's in that holy place that the image of the beast, the abomination that causes desolation is going to be set up by somebody arising from the land of Israel. Wow. And uh, then it says here in verse uh, 15, the end of the verse here, let the reader understand. This is a, just parallel to Revelation 13. This calls for wisdom. Let the reader understand. How can we understand it? By reading the scriptures and by allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal the scriptures, the prophetic word to us. And I believe that is something that we are going to, that we are witnessing right now. When uh, man is being uh, produced artificially, uh, lacking soul, uh, just like that ancient prophecy from Northern Sweden talked about, it is being right now fulfilled through what is called transhumanism. That is what this man, Yuval Noah Harari, is promoting over and over and over. Transhumans that are going to take over this planet. And we are going to give more quotes by him in the next part of this series in part four, because we have to study this and be watchful for what is taking place or what is taking place, I should say, now in the earth and see how the prophetic word is being fulfilled. Because many times it is very hard to understand the prophetic word until it is being fulfilled. Then we realize, ah, this is what was spoken by the prophets. Now we know what this is all about. Uh, so that is what the word, uh, the prophetic word is given to us for uh, also. Let me just give you my uh, understanding here of the mark of the beast. And then I'm going to end for this time. It says uh, here in Revelation 13, the last verse, verse 18, this calls for wisdom. Um, let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man and his number is six. Six, six. We know through scripture that um, the number six is the number of man. Six is the number of man. Well, six, six, six. That is man uh, really becoming God. I believe that is one of the uh, 
ways at least to understand the mark of the beast. And that is what is happening right now through those who want to mark every human individual uh, so that no one can buy or sell without the mark of the beast. And let me say also that this is something that is being implemented in stages. Uh, it doesn't come right away, but it is closing in on humanity like a trap, is what Yeshua said in Luke chapter 21. So the barcode, for instance, of all the things that we buy today and that everyone who sells has to have uh, on the product a barcode, that is pattern after 666. You can study that on the internet if you want to. So people say, well, this is the mark of the beast. Well. It's uh, a beginning of that system. Uh, and, but others say, well, so this is nothing to worry about because we buy or sell all the time here and it's not something that is causing us to, to worship the Antichrist. But uh, we need to watch out. Sooner or later, this system is going to become uh, a control system uh, that is also going to uh, demand our worship and our allegiance. We must pray and watch always that we can escape these things that are coming so that we can stand before the Son of Man. I'm going to continue this series uh, in uh, uh, an, another part here uh, so that we can look closer at what is happening today in the world. But this uh, mark system that is also going to uh, be on uh, every human according to the World Economic Forum and its leader uh, by 2026. It shows us that we are close to the end. The Messiah is at the door and we must be ready for him. Thank you for listening and uh, God bless you. I look forward to continue this series uh, in the next part. Shalom. Seitsemän tuo evankeliumin rohkaisevaa sanomaa jokaiseen kotiin. Haluamme tarjota sinulle ravitsevaa ohjelmaa vuorokauden ympäri sinua kiinnostavista aiheista. Jos hetki sitten katsomasi ohjelma oli sinusta koskettava ja haluat nähdä vastaavanlaisia jatkossakin, voit soittaa tukinumeroon tai antaa lahjasi ruudulla näkyvälle pankkitilille. Muista käyttää myös oikeaa viiten numeroa. Tiesithän, että TV7 Arkista voit katsoa ohjelmiamme juuri sinulle sopivana aikana.